that I move them forward and back. Just say. Yes, um, thank you. Sorry. One, sorry, Sabina. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, so uh, if that's a problem, please just switch off your camera. Sabina. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. And good afternoon or good morning. No, good afternoon, probably everyone. Um, and Megan, I appreciate if you can move the slide uh, for me. So you have already introduced, I'm Sabina, and I will be speaking as representative of Jacobs Foundation in Côte d'Ivoire through um, uh, the consulting company Catalytica that I am co-directing with my associate. So thank you so much, um, Megan and, and ICI colleagues for organizing this webinar. Uh, this afternoon to share the results and uh, I'm sure a lot of lessons learned from the pilot on child-friendly spaces and child labor. So this, um, the idea of this pilot actually dates back from the COVID times. So it was about four years ago with the school closure in Côte d'Ivoire that, uh, uh, that we decided, that Jacobs Foundation decided to support ICI in doing something to address uh, the sudden increase in instances of child labor related to the closure of schools. And so to address this challenge, Jacobs Foundation and ICI um, decided to develop, adapt and pilot approaches to prevent and addressing child labor and also to generate evidence on the effectiveness and on the resilience of the interventions piloted to preventing and addresses, to addressing child labor. So eventually school and eventually and fortunately school closure lasted just a couple of months in Côte d'Ivoire. So by the time actually the pilot kicked off, um, children were back to school. But actually, I think that, uh, you know, the relevance of the work that has been done, of course, goes beyond just, just the exceptional period of the COVID. So we can move to slide two. Thank you so much, uh, um, Megan. So Fidel from uh, Save the Children and Anna from ICI will walk us through the details of the interventions um, that have been uh, implemented as part of the pilot. But before this zooming in, I thought it was useful to recall some of the challenges facing children in Côte d'Ivoire. So I've put a few uh, indicators on these slides. So from malnutrition to child labor, from lack of stimulation and insufficient care, also from learning child challenges to unusually high repetition rates and school dropouts. There are many challenges that actually are facing children in Côte d'Ivoire. Of course, I should mention that the government is very much committed to address these challenges, and it does so with the support of several technical and financial partners, including Jacobs Foundation, ICI, Save the Children and other partners. I let you just, voila, good. So moving to slide three. So even if, as you saw from the, from the few uh, numbers in the previous slide, even if challenges are clearly considerable, the good news is that we're not starting from scratch in our endeavor to address them. There is out there robust evidence on what works to support holistic child development starting at birth. For instance, through the research conducted from Nobel Prize James Heckman, I'm sure many of, of you have heard about him. So his research conducted over the last three decades has been providing policymakers and practitioners very precious insights on child's cognitive and social emotional development and the benefits of investing actually in the early years over the life cycles. There are also a wealth of studies and insights showing that toddlers and children learn much better through play. Other studies also demonstrate that this principle is also applicable not only to early childhood, but also to older children. And a case in point in this regard 
probably you've also heard about this, is teaching at the right level, which is an interactive and playful pedagogy developed in India to improving foundational skills. And then another area that is directly relevant to our topic today is the, the area about extracurricular activities. So there is also growing evidence on the positive impact of extracurricular activities on academic achievements, um, on social emotional skills, and on behavioral outcomes. And actually the work we've been, ICI and, and Save the Children are going to present today is contributing to existing evidence by also adding an additional lens which is related to child protection. We can move to the first slides, Megan, thank you so much. So the next couple of slides provide a few examples of the work Jacobs Foundation has been conducted to support a good start in life and children's learning in Cote d'Ivoire. So for instance, to improve early childhood development, Jacobs Foundation has been uh, promoting parenting education through different delivery channels parenting education uh, session through government social workers or community health agents, also parenting education sessions through radio broadcasts and even through videos distributed, distributed on SIM cards. The objective of these different piloting was to identify the most cost-effective delivery platforms to train parents on good practices related to health, to nutrition, to stimulation, and to child protection. A second example also of Jacobs Foundation Endeavor to bring evidence on what works into practice relate to bridging classes for out-of-school children. So more specifically, Jacobs Foundation has supporting the adaptation of teaching at the right level techniques to bridging classes. So that was the first time that it was done and it has been done in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, in, in bridging classes where out of school children attend a nine months accelerated curriculum with the objective of being integrated into formal schooling. Similarly, and we can move to the next slide, Megan, Jacobs Foundation has also supported the adaptation of this playful pedagogy, teaching at the right level, to the Ivorian context and its integration in the national program for foundational learnings. And the last example and work stream is the work on child-friendly space pilots. And that, and as I said before, the objective here was to prevent child labor, but also support children learning and social emotional skills through extracurriculum activities. Voila. So this being said, so this is a picture that we have inherited from the children in the child friendly spaces. I think we can move on directly to, to Megan to learn a little bit right, Megan, or, or to Fidel to learn a bit more what exactly this uh, intervention was about and then what actually we have learned in, term, in terms of evidence on impact on child protection and on child um, development. Thank you and over to Fidel. Over to Fidel. Thank you very yeah. much indeed, Savina. Um, and so what Fidel is going to do is to tell us a little bit about child-friendly spaces more broadly not about this specific pilot in Cote d'Ivoire, which is what Anna will cover afterwards, but really about the concept of what is a child-friendly space, what are the important elements um, that need to be present, um, and then a little bit about the landscape in both Cote d'Ivoire and a couple of other West African countries um, to show what that involves. So, Fidel, are you still there? Okay, thank you very much. I would like Megan to, to help me to... to to direct the, the slide if you want. No problem at all, Fidel. Okay, thank you very much. Just tell me when you need to change and we will go like that. Over to you. Okay, thank you everyone. We can go to the, the next slide, please. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, um, the child-friendly species are um, a kind of strategy to address the main risk of child protection. And it's very capital on the global framework that we, we, we name uh, minimum standard for child protection in humanitarian action or humanitarian contest. But we can use the child protection, the child-friendly species both at humanitarian context and also um, development context. Why? Because Why? the child friendly species is the central strategy to add, to to implement um, participation of, of children, uh, positive parenting, um, many all the all the main strategies who can address child protection, for example. So basically. Basically, the child friendly species are um, on the standard 15 to address the, the group of activities for well being of children. So, over the participation of the children, the child friendly species help to address the well being of children. They are useful also to deal with the case management to identify vulnerable children and to address all the response concerning their case. As the, the previous presentator said, for example, is also a community-based um, child protection's main strategy. So within the child-friendly species, we can associate and grow the community engagement and also to address all the other um, the other um, what can I say thematic as early childhood uh, strengthening caregivers and the families and so and so and so forth and so and so and so on and so forth so we have also four other uh, standards no, who can know. help to be implemented through the child friendly species. You know, the child friendly species can help also to address the physical or the emotional treatment, for example. They can help to address the mental health uh, through the standard of 10. And as the central topic of our discussion, the child friendly species can help also to prevent and to deal with child labor. And it's a good strategy to be helpful for unaccompanied and, and separated children. The next, please. So as how to set up and uh, how how are the the guidelines to set up a a good French a child friendly species, for example. First of all, it is a good place. Uh, first of all, it, it is a good activities for strategy for, for protection. And the child friendly species, when you want to set up it, you can uh, be aware of, of, of about security, safety, accessibility, uh, concerning gender, diversity, and inclusion. It is a space of community engagement, as uh, um, I, I thought about, and also it is a, a strategy to to address the case of children out of school. In emergency context, for example, it is a space where um, we can deliver protection services, but also health services um, and all the cross sectoral services who can contribute to, to the best protection of children. We can also facilitate participation participation of professional and uh, community uh, uh, experts, and also um, the, the main indicators that we can have to measure the principle uh, of a good friends, child friendly species is the way it is multi-sectoral and can facilitate the referral of the victims of the vulnerable children. Second, uh, next, next, please. So, when we follow those principles to 
to set up a good French child friendly species. Where what are our objectives? Our objective is to, is to create a safe and secure environment for playing and learning, establish positive and supportive interaction between adults and uh, children. These child friendly species can also help to on on the child uh, in the level of the child to maintain self esteem and confidence, to promote interaction to promote participation, resilience, and community engagement, to learn also, but to promote protection by identifying vulnerable children and also to associate um, appropriate uh, referral. So next. And when we have, we finally set up the, the, the child-friendly space, what are we expected for? For the children, we are expected for capacity, for self protection of uh, capacity for self protection by empowerment and psychosocial uh, and resilience strengthening we are expected to to enhance their well-being and mental health we are expecting to involve them on the protection prevention and response and also to address the particular case of children out of school Area child childhood protection case management source space and also referral space between schools and uh, communities. So, child friendly spaces can also uh, help to prevent um, the drop the school dropout and to also help to return the children out of the school to to the school. So, for the communities, it is a tool of community engagement, but also to help community to change their behavior, but also it's a kind of strategy to strengthen social cohesion, for example, in um, emergency contests. They help also to build positive kinship and all, uh, all the, the gap concerning positive parenting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Next. So what kind of activity we can have on the child friendly spaces? Basically, we can have creative activities, imaginative activities, physical activities, communication, manipulation, and mental parenting. So the, that list is not exhaustive, but it's the main activity that we can have. So non-formal education, structure and free play, art and craft, sports, resilience, learnership training, hygiene and health promotion, case management, but also, also parenting and support group that strengthen families and communities. Next. So I'll quickly uh, show you um, two or three examples on the neighboring countries about how the, 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 the experience the child friendly species. Next. So in Cote d'Ivoire, as the previous uh, presenters said, um, basically the child protection is uh, at pilot stage in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. So it is used basically in emergency contests, but also uh, there are some initiatives who address development contests. Globally, the government don't, don't have a global strategy or global framework on this matter, but they are thinking that the, the facilities that they have now who address the early childhood and uh, positive parenting can be associated or can be transforming to, to, to be a good child friendly species. For example, the, those facilities that they have uh, and can be used uh, to address the children out of the school uh, case to also they can use also the positive parenting parenting activities for example to prevent child labor or uh, to also strengthen uh, how the parents can address the other vulnerable vulnerable <laughs> vulnerabilities of, of their children. So um, we can say globally that it is a 
process on ongoing process in Avary, the in Cote d'Ivoire, but there are many many ground bars that can serve to to set up uh, a good uh, strategy of uh, child friendly spaces. I talked with the the best people in charge of the ministry, and they told me that um, they have uh, opportunity of uh, fund opportunity, uh, opportunities in negotiation that can help them to build a good strategy and also to make that transformation. Next. So in Benin um, and Niger, for example, in Benin, they don't have a global framework, but during the COVID time, the government, with the support of UNICEF, they set uh, um, 84 child-friendly species along the, the in the all up, um, in the all the district of the, the the country. But when that's finished, they have transformed those CFS on um, to address the emergency contest. So now they have. Uh, 20, about 20, 20, 21, 22 child friendly species, but only on the, the, the location who are facing terrorism and uh, conflict. So Benin government don't have a global strategy on, on CFS. They don't have clear uh, um, perspective also to, 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 to make a kind of global or national strategy on it. But the case is different in Niger. Uh, on development context, they have a good strategy and the tools. They have also started to to set up some uh, child friendly species who are located at the same places with the social services. But related to the emergency context, uh, that is um, currently deal with each of each ONG, NGO deletes as the, um, the tank and the, the, the big base, the big background that, that, that they, they use is the minimum standard of child protection. But I have been told last uh, week that the government is uh, thinking about a global uh, strategy of CFS to address specifically emergency contests in Niger. So as we can see, uh, Cote d'Ivoire is thinking about strategy. Niger have a strategy on development contests, but is thinking to have another strategy on uh, um, to address emergency contests. But Benin have some social recreational activities, but no uh, clear strategy to address CFS. But as I, I, um, I thought at the beginning, the child friendly species are very central to have quality and uh, a good strategy to address uh, uh, risk of children. But as we can see, many of the countries, countries don't have global uh, strategy, clear strategy to, 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 set, to set it up. So while respecting the guidelines, because other countries have guidelines, each CFS model must be adapted to the local context. So I have, I very appreciated the, 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 the first presentation. In order to be sustainable and in order to be socially, community and financially accessible, because definitely the child protection species should be um, a strategy who is totally led by community actors. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Fidel, for this great overview, not only of what's happening in Côte d'Ivoire and also what the guidelines are at a global level, but also to understand a bit better how this is happening in different ways um, and at different stages of development and formality elsewhere in the region. So Fidel has also provided an excellent list of further resources for anybody interested, um, yeah. which I will scroll over briefly and you will all receive the slide deck afterwards if anybody would like to explore that further. In the meantime, we're going to go now to Anna 
to tell us in more detail about the project that was implemented and about its results. Yes, indeed. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. Um, so, um, indeed, thank you very much, Megan, for the introduction and to Sabina and Fidel uh, for um, this background, which was excellent and um, allows me to jump right into um, the presentation of um, a project um, in which ICI piloted with support from Jacobs Foundation, the use of child-friendly spaces as a means of helping families in cocoa growing communities in Cote d'Ivoire um, to better protect their children. Um, yeah, in a context where the risk of child labor is high and there is a lack of extracurricular um, activities offered to support um, children's development. Um, as we have seen from Sabina's presentation. Um, so I will speak about um, how these spaces were designed um, in the context of this pilot, how they were operated and especially what we learned um, from this pilot. <clears throat> so the approach was tested in three communities um, spread over two cocoa producing regions of Cote d'Ivoire. And um, in each of these three communities, um, quite obviously, the first one of the first steps was to identify an appropriate locality for establishing um, a child friendly space. Um, and that was done in a participatory process with the communities. Um, then we recruited in each of the communities three animators who were trained specifically for this role. Um, in collaboration uh, with the ministry. Um, and then in each of the communities, we organized actually a series of awareness raising sessions addressed at all the parents um, and the children and also the teachers in the community um, to introduce, first of all, the contact, the concept um, of the of a child friendly space, which was new to most people. Um, to explain um, the objectives and also um, the operational modalities to the communities and also more broadly to raise awareness on child protection and children's rights um, and the concept of positive discipline. And then the spaces started operating um, in the beginning of 2022. Um, and they were open to children aged, in that case, between five and 17 years. Um, so each, um, each in each community, the spaces had a capacity to hold to host um, 25 children at a time. Um, and they, um, the opening times were on Wednesdays, um, on weekends and during school holidays, so in order to avoid any overlap um, with school hours. So our specific objectives for this project were um, uh, to find a new way to tackle child labor by um, offering an alternative um, two children um, to going to the farm with their parents um, outside of school hours. Um, then also um, to um, allow children to create new links between peers, particularly also um, to children who are out of school um, and to uh, reinforce links between children um, that have been working and children that have not been working. Um, and um, also importantly to create um, within the community a deeper understanding of child development and the importance of extracurricular activities in addition to traditional um, education objectives. Um, and lastly, as we've also heard from Fidel, um, as a means to detect cases of child abuse and violence um, and to be able to refer such cases to the relevant child protection structures. 
Um, so, um, obviously, we wanted to learn whether this approach was effective to um, enhance child development and child protection in the communities, including protecting children from child labor, um, and to um, test whether the approach was feasible to integrate within existing programs and strategies to protect children in the cocoa sector. Um, to, for, our for our evaluation, we uh, relied on different data sources, so including um, the attendance lists of the centers to check which uh, children actually participated um, with which regularity. Um, then we collected surveys on knowledge, attitude and practices towards um, child uh, protection and child development topics amongst all parents in the community. Um, and we conducted um, many qualitative interviews and focus group discussions with different stakeholders, um, including the children, parents um, and the animators. So what did we learn? Um, first of all, we wanted to understand which families and which children within the community were most likely to take up um, the offer. Um, and you can see um, in, the, in this graph that um, first of all, the children and the, the um, spaces were actually most popular amongst children at primary school age, um, roughly speaking. Um, and you can see that adolescent children above the age of 14 um, were quite underrepresented um, in the centers. And we can also see that within all age groups, girls were less likely to attend the centers um, as compared to boys. And in this graph, um, you can see that the project was indeed um, successful at also reaching out to uh, out of school children. So 9% of all children who ever attended um, the spaces were not enrolled in school. So for them, obviously, the spaces offered an important opportunity to interact with peers. Um, in, so in response to this observation that girls and also older children were underrepresented um, in the spaces, we collected some additional data from parents and children to understand what prevented these groups from um, attending the spaces. And the main obstacles they told us about were, first of all, work obligations. So this concerned mostly ad adolescent children. Um, for girls, that um, included that they were expected to participate in household chores. So um, when we talked to children, that's what they brought forward as reasons why they would not attend the spaces more regularly. Um, second, the older children also told us that actually the games and activities that were offered at the spaces did um, not um, correspond super well to their interests. So that's what some um, children mentioned. Um, and lastly, some parents told us um, that they were actually not aware that the spaces were open and free of charge for all families in the community. So. Um, our information and awareness raising sessions had obviously missed out on some parents within the community. We also wanted to um, understand the profile of parents uh, that made were more likely to make use of, of the service. Um, and we found that on the one hand, single parents were more likely to send their children um, to the spaces, um, which um, for us was a positive observation because 
um, for these parents, the spaces obviously filled an important um, gap in um, childcare facilities. And secondly, we also observed that the education level of parents who used the spaces was above average um, in the community. So um, that could be explained by the fact that parents with higher education levels were maybe more open to the importance of extracurricular um, activities for children's development. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, we um, examined how the spaces affected attitude attitudes, um, sorry, knowledge, attitudes and um, behavior of parents within the communities. Um, and so we collected surveys amongst a random draw of parents in the community. Um, so that included parents sending their children to the centers um, and also other parents. And um, yeah, we collected basically um, a survey using the same questions before the spaces were opened and then after they had been operating for about one year. So that's our baseline and endline situation. So globally, we cannot see much positive change on knowledge or attitudes amongst uh, the parents surveyed. However, what we can see is a positive effect on parents' um, protective and supporting practices. Um, so concretely, um, this means that parents um, at end line were more likely to, on the one hand, use positive discipline, um, also to give children time to play and to engage in child development activities with them. So again, um, we do see this as a very positive result because um, in the end, it's often the behavior change part um, where it is indeed most, most um, challenging um, to um, achieve uh, changes. Now, coming to the quite central question, whether indeed the approach did help tackle child labor, in the project communities. So um, to get a quantitative um, sense uh, on the effect, we looked at data from child labor monitoring and remediation systems, which um, were implemented in the project communities. So a total of around um, 250 children um, in the project communities were covered by a CLMRS implemented by ICI and were monitored before the start of the project. So that's basically the sample of children um, on which we had some information um, on their child labor engagement. And from these data, first of all, we found that 40% of children who attended the child-friendly spaces had been identified in child labor before, compared to um, around 30% of children in the same communities not attending the spaces. So in terms of targeting of the approach, we can say um, that indeed the spaces reached um, quite effectively um, this particularly vulnerable group of children. Then to the right hand um, on this slide, you can see that um, the, CLMRS, the CLMRS data shows um, that children attending the spaces were indeed more likely um, to stop working. So um, specifically more than 80% of children previously in child labor who attended the child-friendly spaces had stopped working after their first follow-up visit, which compares to 43% um, of children in child labor who did not attend the child-friendly spaces. Um, so um, 
I um, have to also um, alert you that this uh, is really based on quite a small sample um, because only a subset of the children that had been identified in child labor were then followed up within the relevant time frame. Nevertheless, the numbers do suggest that the spaces were indeed effective um, at addressing child labor at, by offering an alternative um, to parents. Um, and as you will see, um, this was also confirmed by our qualitative data. Um, and this is um, what I will be um, presenting next. So um, we held, as I mentioned, um, several focus group discussions and qualitative interviews with um, different stakeholder groups within the um, community and how they perceived the spaces and what for them were the key benefits. So I'm starting with the most important stakeholder group, which are the children themselves. So we asked children to um, express their views on the spaces in group discussions, in one-to-one -one interviews, and also through drawings um, in which we asked them to um, present uh, what the spaces um, had brought to their lives. So overall, um, maybe the most important theme that children expressed was that the spaces for them offered a place to play, to make new friends, um, to interact with peers, um, and a place where they felt um, at ease and happy. Um, the, the children also said that they, the, the activities um, proposed at the centers allowed them to practice things they learned at school, such as uh, reading, drawing, singing, and uh, their French language skills. Mm, and then um, children, from their perspective, also said they appreciated um, that the spaces provided an um, alternative to accompanying their parents to the fields. So I'm quoting one child here which said, when I come to the child-friendly space, I'm happy and enjoy myself, but when I go to the field and take the machete to clean up, it hurts me. We also asked the children specifically um, what they suggested could be improved around the spaces. Um, and one of the most important points they, that was mentioned by several children was that um, they saw the games and materials um, starting to be worn out after some time and they needed replacement. Um, and then some children also said um, they wish to have more variety in the um, in the materials and games offered. So after some times they got bored always playing the same games and they wished to discover something new. Then we asked the animators for their views um, on the spaces. Um, and what um, they shared from their perspectives actually quite um, echoed the children's views. Um, they also um, saw, first of all, great value um, in the safe environment the spaces offered um, for children to play and socialize. Thank you. Um, they also um, observed that children uh, learned important skills which were complementary to what they learned um, in their formal education, so notably social competences, um, but that children could also practice reading and um, cognitive skills. Um, and this is all nicely summarized in um, the following quote by, by one of the animators. The children have developed protective behavior and adopted better hygiene practices. 
um, they got to know their rights and duties, and this has helped bring the children closer together. We also asked the animators um, what they thought should be improved um, around the child-friendly spaces, um, and they said um, they wished for the outside um, play areas around the spaces to be fenced, um, so to um, protect those spaces from, um, yeah, uh, people passing by to just enter and also um, to allow, um, made it easier to keep those spaces clean um, and also prevent animals from, from entering um, that space, um, the spaces where children played outside. Um, then um, they, um, helped us realize that um, the provision of drinking water and first aid kits uh, needed to be assured. Um, so that's what um, was then um, improved um, immediately. Um, and um, yeah, they wished for the spaces um, to be enlarged um, simply because uh, uh, they felt that um, children were sometimes um, too squeezed um, in the space uh, provided. Um, and lastly, um, they said uh, that um, provision of meals would um, help uh, to keep the children um, at the space um, during longer periods in the same day. And um, yeah, that's something that the community should consider um, to, to provide in the long run. And obviously we also collected parents' views um, on the spaces, sorry. Um, so parents emphasized that for them, the spaces were indeed um, an important childcare facility, uh, which allowed an alternative um, for them to uh, taking their children to the fields um, because, uh, yeah, um, on Wednesdays, on weekends, and during school holidays, um, they often just had no alternative um, to taking the children with them um, when they went uh, to work. And um, thanks to the centers, um, they um, could leave uh, their children in, um, yeah, in. Uh, in that safe environment um, where they felt um, confident that the children were in good hands. And they also appreciated um, that the centers offered a safe space uh, where their children um, felt happy um, and where they, they really liked to spend time and to go to meet friends. And then parents also emphasized that the project had been good for the community cohesion, all the discussions um, that took place around um, defining yeah, the operational modalities, um, identifying suitable spaces, um, etc. Um, really uh, brought the community closer together. And uh, they also said that the whole project increased their awareness of child protection um, and what children uh, need for that for for their development. Um, and the recommendations from parents on how the spaces could be improved uh, really um, are uh, completely aligned to what the um, facilitators um, had already shared with us, so they um, also wished for the spaces to be um, larger, for the spaces to also offer meals for children, um, and parents added that they wished that more um, facilitators could be hired. So what are our main takeaways from this pilot? 
um, first of all, these child-friendly spaces um, do respond to a need for childcare um, in the communities while parents are in the fields in the absence of um, other solutions. Um, and that was much appreciated um, by parents and by children. Then the spaces did offer a safe space for children to play um, and to develop important skills and socialize with their peers. Um, and this was really complementary to um, formal education um, objectives. Um, and then for us, it was also important to see that parents did appreciate the concept and the pedagogical approach um, of the child-friendly spaces, which was indeed new um, to most of the members of the communities, um, but which um, they took up and um, allowed them to also change their practices um, in uh, their um, education. Nevertheless, there are a few um, important recommendations that came out of the pilot. Um, so yeah, well, globally, um, we do recommend this approach for scale up and inclusion as part of systems to prevent and address child labor. Um, nevertheless, it's really important when setting up um, these spaces that they are equipped um, and that all infrastructure um, and equipment um, needed is um, in place um, and um, that the communities are indeed um, encouraged to participate um, in the equipment um, and the setting up of the infrastructure. Um, and lastly, when such spaces are set up, we must also think about their sustainability from the very beginning um, and ensure that a plan exists for their continued operation after the initial phase of setting them up. Um, so to cover the running costs, which mainly um, include the maintenance of the facilities, replacement of materials, um, as we heard from children, um, and obviously the salaries for the animators. So all these results um, and more are available in a report which uh, we have just published, which is available on our website in English and French language um, with um, all the results I presented to you now and um, some more detail. And I'll stop here and thank you for your attention and um, look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. And you'll see in the chat that Anna um, Dinner has just posted a link to that report, which has been published on our Knowledge Hub today. It's available in both English and French, um, so please feel free to go and find that either now or after the session. We have about half an hour left um, for your questions for discussion with all the different presenters and others. Uh, so over to you. Maybe before we start, and while you have time to think of your questions, I wanted to specifically pass to our colleague Anderson, who looks very green on the screen, but has kindly joined us from on the road in the field. Um, and Anderson has been involved since the very beginning of this project on supervising the operational aspects and making sure that it all happened in reality. Uh, one of the things that Anna mentioned, but that was also mentioned, I think, by, by Sabina in her presentation, was how important it is to pave the road for a new and innovative intervention to happen and to take place and to be accepted by the community. And I think this is a really nice example of an innovative approach, but not something that's really new 
in the sense that, as Fidel said, child-friendly spaces are used all over the world in many different contexts. However, it's innovative in the sense that it's not being used in this particular context for these specific aims. And I think it's it's a great example of how you don't have to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel in order to be able to put something um, from one context to another that's effective. Uh, so maybe Anderson, could you tell us a bit about how those perceptions changed over the course of the project and maybe some of the initial reluctance by community members and by parents, how they felt before and then how they felt afterwards? OK, thank you, Megan. Can I speak French and you are going to translate for me? If you like, yeah. Because that will be better, yeah. OK. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Dans le projet, ce que nous avons fait, c'est déjà de d'impliquer la communauté dans la mise en œuvre. Il était important pour nous que la communauté soit impliquée dans la mise en œuvre. Et puis, euh, il y a eu un partenariat entre ICI, la communauté, mais surtout avec le ministère. Voilà. Je ne sais pas si on traduit au fur et à mesure. Mais je crois oui, c'est très bien. Il y, a trois il y a trois entités qui étaient impliquées dedans. Il y a le gouvernement à travers le ministère de la Femme, Famille et Enfants, qui nous a accompagnés dans toutes les formations sur euh, les espaces. C'est eux qui sont les spécialistes de ces espaces-là. Et puis au final, on leur remet ces espaces-là pour qu'ils s'en servent comme centre aéré. Donc c'était important pour nous d'impliquer le ministère, la communauté qui nous a accompagnés, et puis ICI dans son mécanisme de protection. Super, merci Anderson. Ou bien... Ok. Je vais, je vais commencer la traduction et sinon... Okay. Je vais oublier ce que okay, tu viens de dire au début. Um, okay. So Anderson explained that it was very important from the beginning of the project, obviously, to work very closely with the different communities involved, but also with the relevant ministries. Um, so in particular, the Ministry of Women Families, um, which is uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, the, the ministry that's uh, most closely related to this kind of intervention. Do you continue? OK. Merci beaucoup. Donc, pour nous... Quand on fait le projet sur un an, quand on fait la phase pilote sur un an ou deux, après, il faut remettre le centre au ministère pour envoyer des professionnels pour continuer à travailler avec la communauté en termes de durabilité. Voilà. Donc, quand on a fini de travailler sur la phase pilote, le ministère récupère le centre et puis l'on fait quelque chose d'important dans la communauté. Parce que ça n'existe pas dans nos villages. Il y a un espace euh, child friendly space, ça n'existe pas dans les villages. Donc, Aujourd'hui, ça devient quelque chose d'intéressant pour le ministère pour que les enfants soient occupés autrement pendant les vacances. Et pendant les périodes où ils ne sont pas à l'école, qu'ils ne soient pas obligés de partir euh, au champ, mais qu'ils soient là et qu'ils s'entraînent entre eux, qu'ils aient un spécialiste qui puisse les accompagner, faire leur prise en charge. Sur certaines... Quand des enfants ont des besoins, ils savent qu'ils peuvent échanger avec leurs camarades, leur, leur père, et puis... Vraiment, c'est quelque chose d'important. Ça nous permet de les former sur leurs droits. Ça nous permet de leur dire qu'ils peuvent s'amuser. Ça nous permet également de former les parents. Donc, c'est vraiment important pour nous qu'on ait les centres-là et qu'on ait le ministère qui soit impliqué, qu'on ait les familles qui soient impliquées. Merci, Anderson. Bon. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, so, just to add that, that the initial pilot phase after the first year or so of operation, it was really important to build in to the project this plan for long-term sustainability. So make sure those activities, if successful, could continue in a more formal way. So this proof of concept, if you like, was allowed. Um, and then it was negotiated with the authorities who were receptive to the idea and saw the value of these spaces, especially during the school holidays um, where children didn't have other activities to do. Um, and that, that plan for long-term sustainability has now been assured, which is excellent. Okay, Pardon? merci. Autour du projet, on a, on a formé les familles sur la prise en charge des enfants. Donc, le premier aspect, avant que la famille ne soit impliquée, on les a formés. Donc, on a formé les membres des, des familles, des parents, sur la parentalité positive. Et on s'est également euh, appuyé sur tout ce qu'on avait comme droit des enfants, droit du, des parents, tous ces aspects-là. Donc, on a formé les enfants, on a formé, on a formé les enfants, on a formé les parents et le ministère venait superviser les animateurs communautaires qui sont un peu des bénévoles qu'on avait mis dans les centres 
pour voir si le travail qu'ils faisaient était bien fait et leur accompagnement, leur formation, leur accompagnement. Donc, au début, mmh. les parents étaient réticents, mais après, quand ils se sont rendus compte que les enfants ont commencé à bien s'exprimer, les enfants ont commencé à avoir, prendre de la responsabilité, on s'est retrouvé avec des centres qui étaient surchargés. Du coup, on a dû faire des programmes pour les enfants. Parce que les centres peuvent accueillir en moyenne 50 à 70 enfants, mais il y a des jours où on se retrouvait avec une centaine d'enfants. Donc cette organisation-là, c'est parce que les parents ont compris, les parents étaient formés et ça a tiré les enfants des champs. Ce que les centres ont pu faire, c'est que dans nos villages, c'est bon, je continue, Mégane, dans nos villages, les mamans n'ont pas d'espace où mettre les enfants avant de partir. Si je continue, mais tu, tu veux traduire Do you want to translate bit for, oui, oui uh, j'aimerais bien. Okay. Attends juste un instant, s'il te plaît. Mm. Um, so, Anderson was explaining the importance of training, which was uh, really essential throughout the project. And uh, that training happened with obviously the children who were involved, as well as the facilitators that was mentioned by Anna, but also with the parents themselves. So there's been a lot of discussion around positive parenting and these are aspects that were also mentioned by Fidel and by Sabina in their presentations, the importance of parental behaviour um, as part of that. And for all those trainings, the relevant ministries were involved in the supervision of those trainings to make sure that it was, it was aligned and it was more successful than expected in many ways. And then it really changed the way that those centres had to be organised, because while I think there was some reluctance at the beginning, um, the word started to spread about the fact that the activities on offer were interesting and children began to come and it actually exceeded the capacity of those spaces. So where there were sessions originally planned for 60, 70 children, there were occasions where 100 children arrived and it became actually quite difficult to manage. So they had to work together with the communities involved to, to reorganise a little bit to be able to make sure that they had a manageable number of children coming on any given day. But it's also proof of of those sessions working. Tu peux continuer? Ok, merci beaucoup. Pardon. Oh, merci beaucoup. Il y a l'un des aspects qui était important également. La de... Madame, la... il y a l'un des éléments qui était important dedans, c'est que les centres permettaient au moment de laisser leurs enfants dans les centres avant d'aller au champ. Parce qu'avant, dans les champs, les mamans partaient au champ avec les enfants parce qu'il n'y avait personne il n'y avait personne, pour, il n'y avait aucun endroit où pouvaient mettre les enfants en sécurité. Donc, le centre leur offrait des espaces de sécurité où pouvaient laisser leurs enfants et puis partir au champ. Donc, ça a été un gain assez intéressant parce qu'un moment qui se dit, euh, j'ai le centre, je peux laisser mon enfant et puis aller au champ en paix, c'était le centre a sécurisé le moment. Donc, du coup, ça, le centre est appar, les centres sont apparus comme, je veux dire, euh, je ne dirais pas des, des espaces en termes de sécurité pour les enfants. L'une des raisons que les mamans avançaient pour partir au champ avec les enfants, c'était qu'il n'y a personne chez qui ils vont laisser les enfants. Donc, quand l'enfant ne va pas à l'école, pour un enfant qui n'est pas scolarisé, c'est juste le, euh, le centre qui leur offrait l'opportunité de dire « Ah, que je laisse mon enfant là et ils s'en vont en cette... » Donc, euh, cet aspect-là également était important. Et ça fait que le centre euh, pour la maternelle, les, la petite enfance, l'école des petites enfances, les... La fréquentation de, de l'école des petites enfants a augmenté. C'est passé de, au certain centre de, à, à 300 de demandes. Puisque les moments ont senti l'importance maintenant de laisser leurs enfants dans des espaces qui sont gérés par des professionnels. Donc, pour moi, c'était un aspect assez important que les, dans les communautés, on ait un espace où les parents peuvent laisser les enfants en sécurité avec des professionnels. Voilà. Merci bon? beaucoup, Anderson. Je vais traduire ce que tu viens de dire. So the other aspect that Anderson wanted to mention was the importance of these centres as a form of safe, trusted childcare. Um, and being able to drop your child off before going to the fields meant that um, parents, mothers in particular, were able to leave their children in safe hands in an environment where they knew um, that they were looked after. Um, and that also had a knock-on effect in terms of enrolment in primary school, uh, which wasn't mentioned in the presentation, but is something very interesting to see how the non-formal and formal education are linked as well. I'm going to stop there. Have you finished, Anderson? Yeah, c'est bon pour moi. S'il y a des questions, on pourra toujours y répondre. S'il y a des questions, mais globalement, c'est comme ça que ça a fonctionné avec la communauté qui a accepté les projets parce qu'on les a formés. 
et puis le ministère qui nous a accompagnés et à qui on va remettre les centres pour que ce soit un centre euh, public maintenant. Un centre qui rentre dans le gouvernement, qui va payer les animateurs, donc c'est toujours intéressant pour nous. Pour les prochains centres, il y en a, on va commencer avec le ministère. Cette fois-ci, sur la phase pilote, c'est ICI qui a commencé seul et puis on a invité le ministère. Mais cette fois-ci, comme on a les références des ministères, c'est de commencer avec eux et puis finir, quoi. ça sera bon. Fantastic. Some lessons learned in relation to coordination as well. I can see several hands raised, so we can move over maybe first to Sabina, and then I can see other questions afterwards. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. I actually just wanted, you know, like directly in relation to what Anderson, Bonjour Anderson, explained to us. I, I just would like to make, uh, well, first of all, to uh, welcome, right, the wise uh, thoughts to start first from the ministry, so the other way around, right? But actually, if I understood correctly, I mean, the, the very promising things that has happened. So in the beginning, when eventually the Ministry of, um, of uh, Women, Family and Child was approached, they said, mm -hmm. well, guys, we, we don't have anything like child friendly spaces, right, in our way of functioning. So they were a bit embarrassed. What do we do with that? And then I guess after some conversation and reflection with ICI, if I understood correctly, they came up with the idea to say, look, we actually have about, I can't remember how many around, around the countries, but probably some 300 CACE, which are the child care spaces in the communities for the kids from, let's say, two to five years old, right? And so the centers, I think this is what Anderson referred to, they're used during weekdays, but in the afternoons of Wednesdays and, and vacations and, and uh, weekends, they're not used. So it means that already today, you know, there is an opportunity to use existing CACE that are in rural communities. I, I see some of the industry colleagues that have built themselves, are supporting to build these centers. And actually, as of tomorrow, there is an opportunity, you know, to really reach out to the ministry and say, hey, guys, let's let's use this, you know, as child friendly spaces as of uh, the next school year. So I think that, you know, I really appreciated the very pragmatic way of looking at things from the ministry perspective, because one of the biggest challenges, as we know, is the infrastructure. This is what is costly, right? And so the fact that they came up with the idea, you know, let's combine the same infrastructure for two different age groups, I really find really welcoming and encouraging, right, in terms also of investments, uh, valuing investments from partners. So just wanting to share the thoughts and thank you so much over to you again. Okay. Many thanks indeed, Sabina. Anderson, yeah, you want to react? Merci, Sabina. Oui, I heard, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, merci, Sabina. Ce que je veux dire, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de centres, il y a beaucoup de CACE. Quand on est parti avec le ministère, les, les CACE, c'est particulier. C'est vrai qu'on n'utilise pas les CACE pendant les vacances. Euh, ce qui a fait que le ministère nous a proposé de passer de CACE à des CAE, CACE, de faire la combinaison, c'était que le processus allait être long. Parce que les CACE, c'est comme des centres aérés, c'est particulier. Et il y a les mercredis soir, il y a les samedis, et puis il y a les dimanches où les gens utilisent des CACE. Et quand les enfants sont en vacances, et puis quand ils sont en congé, les CAE, pardon. Maintenant, les CACE, c'est vrai que c'est pour ça finit en mai en ce moment-là. Les locaux sont là, mais il y a tout notre dispositif. Je comprends ce que Sabine a dit, le, le défi, c'est les constructions, mais les CACE, c'est particulier. Les jeux ne sont pas forcément les mêmes que les enfants que de, des CACE, qui sont des enfants de la petite enfance. Or, nous, on, les CAE touchent les enfants de 5 à 17 ans, plus des plus âgés, donc les jeunes ne seront pas forcément adaptés. On peut réfléchir à un mécanisme, comme le ministère a dit. Si on veut, mettre, on veut créer les CAE, les CAE officiellement, ça va prendre beaucoup de temps, parce que les décrets ici, ça prend beaucoup de temps. C'est pour ça qu'ils nous ont dit, OK, pour qu'on accepte rapidement de prendre, il faut qu'on combine les deux. Quand on dit c'est CACE pendant l'école, et puis c'est CACE, mais en réalité, les CAE, 
ils ont leur place dans la nomencla... dans l'ensemble des, des structures à base communautaire, des structures socio-éducatives pour les enfants. Mais si on demande aujourd'hui au ministère de prendre et d'affecter quelqu'un, ça va prendre du temps. Donc, si on dit c'est CACE, CAE, c'est pour ça, c'est pour ça qu'ils nous demandent de faire ça, mais pas parce qu'ils veulent revenir sur euh, des l'importance des, des centres amis des enfants. Mais si on demande, aux, ils disent que s'ils disent au ministère, au gouvernement aujourd'hui, de prendre un décret pour la création officielle des, CA, des CAE, avec tout ce que ça comporte comme principe, ça va prendre trop de temps. Donc, pour qu'eux, ils, ils puissent nous affecter quelqu'un rapidement sur le projet pilote, on doit dire, OK, on fait une combinaison CAE, CACE. Ça leur laisse le temps de faire des décrets pour dire, OK, officiellement, on crée les CAE qui ont un certain nombre de principes et puis on affecte des travailleurs sociaux. Je ne sais pas si tu comprends. Donc, pour nous, le CAE, c'est des la petite enfant 0 à 5 ans, mais les CAE, on veut vraiment toucher tous les enfants qui viennent des collèges, qui, viennent dans le, qui reviennent au village, qui viennent, euh, qui sont au, peut-être au lycée, qui n'ont, qui, ont, qui n'ont pas 18 ans, tous les enfants, qu'on puisse les capter par des jeux. Oh, les CAE, c'est vraiment la petite enfance. Mais Aujourd'hui, on est un peu pressé parce qu'on veut passer sur le ministère. Donc, la combinaison va nous arranger pour que le ministère nous affecte quelqu'un rapidement parce que c'est la phase pilote. C'est pour ça que pour euh, les prochains CAE qu'on va mettre en place, on commence avec le ministère dans le choix même des communautés, en fonction de nos critères sur l'impact que ça a sur le travail des enfants. Et puis, on va avancer. Quoi. Je ne sais pas si vous m'avez compris. Donc, euh, l'idée de, du ministère, c'est qu'on puisse passer rapidement, qu'on nous offre rapidement du personnel c'est pour ça qu'on accepte de passer de CAE à CAE, CACE, cette combinaison là comme transition. Je parle rapidement, j'espère pas. Hein. C'est bon, Sabina, c'est, c'est bon. C'est très un bien. Peu. Okay. Merci. Merci. C'est pour ça. Merci beaucoup, Anderson. There was a detailed discussion there about the difference between the Centre Ami des Enfants, CAE, so a child-friendly space, and the CACE, which is the existing straight state structure for uh, early childhood. Of course, they're not exactly the same. Um, but the possibility to use the physical infrastructure and combine some of those functions is a really interesting one, um, which definitely deserves further discussion and possibilities in the future. And I think it's great if this pilot has shown and started that discussion happening, because as Sabina said at the beginning, it wasn't at all on the table. And, and there are now opportunities, which is also uh, what uh, Fidel was mentioning in his presentation too. So it's great that echoes of that are travelling. I would like to turn to some of the questions from the floor, and I can see a hand raised from Pascal. On t'entend pas pour l'instant, Pascal. Now it's okay. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah. So yes, my, my question is twofold. The first one is, what uh, is a running cost, maybe per year per child for? Um, child-friendly space. And the second one is, what uh, idea do we have to cover this long-term running cost at community level? Okay, excellent questions. Um, okay, je peux répondre à la question de Pascal? Vas-y, Anderson. Donc, euh, pour, les, pour les trois centres amis des enfants, on a dépensé en moyenne En réalité, on n'avait pas prévu de construction, donc on a dépensé en moyenne 30 millions par centre. Donc les 300 nous ont revenu à 30, 90 millions, tout compris. Mais ce qu'on fera, en, si on veut passer à l'échelle, c'est de, d'impliquer le ministère et que le personnel qui nous, coûtait, qui nous a coûté un peu cher quand même, que ce personnel soit affecté par le ministère. Donc je me dis que ça va réduire relativement les coûts si on a fini de faire les constructions. Nous, on pourra accompagner en faisant les réalisations, les constructions, mais le ministère va mettre en place euh, tout le dispositif. Donc, ça va relativement coûter moins cher qu'une école. Quoi. Et puis, ça sera assez, ça aura assez d'impact également. Mais là, comme on a pris merci. tout en charge, les, forma- les formations, tout était dedans. C'est pour ça que ça a coûté 30 millions par centre à peu près. So, the initial cost mentioned by Anderson in the context of this project was 30 million FCFA per, per uh, child. And at the beginning, it wasn't uh, the plan to totally construct new infrastructure from scratch. The idea had been to use existing facilities, um, but that wasn't the case um, in reality. So obviously, the construction costs were quite important as part of that. 
Um, but another cost that was uh, noticeable as part of that budget was the personnel, and that was the finding and the training um, of the facilitators that worked in that space. So for future, if it's part of a national strategy, um, there are the possibilities to make sure that that training um, is taken and managed by local authorities. So that's definitely something to be discussed in the future. I can also see some questions in the chat, which I think would be nice to answer. So I can see one from Roger Tano, um, who wanted to know why some parents were resistant at the beginning. What were their reasons for being against the child-friendly space? Maybe Anna, would you like to respond to that based on some of the interviews and the data that you saw? And then that can be complemented by Anderson. Um, yes, I can start uh, with maybe one element. Uh, we um, could we heard from parents during the qualitative um, interviews, and that was um, initially uh, the centers were seen as um, a kind of in competition to formal education. Um, so in the very beginning um, of the planning phase and the interactions um, with communities about when the spaces should be open, um, the idea was for them uh, to actually be open on every day of the week. And then um, parents um, um, were um, skeptical because they felt, well, children should be going to school during um, that time. And um, uh, also um, in, in terms of the um, educational um, objectives, it really um, took some community um, awareness raising um, to make parents understand that the educational objective of the centers were really not at all um, to kind of um, uh, overlap uh, necessarily with formal education objectives, but really to be complementary. So for children um, to have this um, space to play, um, a safe space where they can be um, free and happy to uh, follow their moods um, and their interests and um, so this was it was really um, a process for members of the community to understand the importance of this um, but also to put it in the right place as a complementary um, objective to formal education uh, which yeah um, puts the emphasis more on the um, learning of reading, writing, and cognitive um, skills. Um, so uh, really um, understanding simply the key objective of the centers um, was um, was was a journey and was new to the communities. But um, importantly, as I as I emphasized. Um, it was something that was eventually very much um, appreciated by parents. Anderson, would you like to add anything to that? Okay. Uh, la question, c'était juste pourquoi il y avait certains parents qui étaient résistants uh, au début. Oui, les parents étaient résistants au début parce que, allô, d'accord, les parents étaient résistants au début parce qu'ils pensaient que c'était juste un centre où on allait, les enfants allaient juste pour jouer, ça n'allait pas, pas avoir d'impact positif. Est-ce qu'on a pu, après les formations, ils se sont rendus compte que la, même le jeu est important pour le développement cognitif de leurs enfants. Donc, ils étaient résistants au départ parce qu'ils n'avaient pas été formés. Mais après les, formations, les sessions de formation et puis un certain nombre de choses, on leur a expliqué ce que c'était que le centre. Ce n'était pas juste un endroit où on partait simplement s'amuser, mais les enfants partaient pour apprendre et apprendre la responsabilité. Donc, et ça a fait que les parents sont venus plus nombreux. Là, ils se sont rendus compte. Il y a certains qui disent même que, ah, depuis que nos enfants fréquentent les centres, ils sont devenus plus éveillés, on n'a plus besoin de. Ils, 
Voilà, donc c'est des choses comme ça. Les gens ne savaient pas. Donc, les témoignages de certains parents pour lesquels les enfants ont changé d'attitude, ça a amené les autres à venir. Voilà. Mais au départ, tout naturellement, tout ce qui est nouveau, il y a toujours cette méfiance dans nos communautés. Ils pensent toujours qu'on vient avec des choses de la ville pour embrouiller leurs enfants. Et puis après, ils se rendent compte que c'est, c'est assez intéressant pour les enfants. C'était un peu ça. Aujourd'hui, Excellent. même quand on, on a un souci, même dans les centres, que on dit ah pendant deux jours, c'est fermé. Eux-mêmes nous appellent pour dire ah, mais les centres sont fermés, nos enfants sont nuits. Voilà, donc ils ont compris l'importance. Voilà. Many thanks, Anderson. So to very quickly translate uh, for anyone who doesn't speak French, the the reason shared by Anderson was that parents thought that these centres were just going to be a place where children would only play and that the value of play was not uh, appreciated by the parents in these communities who understandably are suspicious of new things in the first place, but because of the training, because of the awareness raising, and because of the engagement with the parents, as well as the uh, ability to see what was happening um, and having the feedback from other parents in the community, uh, that idea changed. So the value of playing as a support to learning, as was very nicely explained by Sabina at the beginning, uh, wasn't appreciated at the beginning, but was much more so over the course of the project. I can see a hand from Peter, if you'd like to ask your question. All right. Uh, good day to everyone and uh, Megan. So a quick one. Uh, I think my question goes to Anna. In listening to you, one of the things from maybe the findings that you presented revealed that there was much more like uh, a decrease in work I mean, like some of the children who were probably found to be in child labor, there was a decrease by virtue of this intervention. And those who started coming to the play fields, also the, there was decrease in work. And I wanted to find out that, you know, in the generic sense, when you say work, maybe I will understand it as maybe the child labor, you know, with the activities that they were involved in. Is that the understanding? If yes. We also understand that there is also the dimension of the children socializing with work. Did you consider the possible correlations of the frequency of children coming to these spaces and how that will ultimately affect the, uh, the kind of, uh, should I say, child-friendly work that they are supposed to do at home? Does it really affect and because it is important to consider these factors because in the long run, as we talk about sustainability, if much of the attention is drawn to these child-friendly uh, spaces and children ultimately don't want to do any other things like socializing with work, then that will cause parents ultimately to decide that we will not allow you to go back to those places because it's like ultimately the child is becoming lazy or something. So these are contextual issues that I don't know whether you considered in the project and whether you have tried to look at the various analysis in that regard. So if you could share some light in that perspective. Yeah, thank you. Oui, Anna, je peux répondre à la question pour lui. Je peux répondre à la question. La question, c'est quoi? Les animateurs sont dans la communauté. Donc, ils veillent à ce que les enfants fassent le travail qu'ils ont à faire à la maison avant de venir au centre. Donc, les animateurs échangent avec les parents pour voir l'enfant qui n'est pas sage à la maison ne viendra pas au centre. L'enfant qui refuse de, 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 de laver les assiettes, pour la fille qui refuse de laver les assiettes, les animateurs sont en communauté. Donc, je veux dire, c'est pas juste, on ne vient pas placer un centre dans une communauté sans échanger en permanence avec les parents. Je ne sais pas si vous comprenez. Voilà, donc les parents sont impliqués dans la réalisation ou les activités qu'on mène au centre. Du coup, un parent peut venir dire à un animateur, mon enfant a refusé de faire telle chose, de telle sorte qu'on puisse sensibiliser l'enfant à son travail socialisant. Voilà, donc ce n'est pas quelque chose qui vient dans la communauté comme un cheveu sur la soupe, ça vient aider. Donc il y a un échange permanent qu'on a établi entre les animateurs, il y a des échanges hebdomadaires, mais quelquefois c'est des les parents ont avec les animateurs de sorte qu'ils puissent leur faire un retour sur l'attitude des enfants. Voilà, donc on n'a pas à s'inquiéter pour ces questions-là. Un parent, 
Et le centre n'est pas on ne dit pas à l'enfant qui est obligé de venir au centre. Et les plans, sont, les programmes sont faits avec les enfants, mais les parents sont impliqués dedans. C'est ce que je dis. Il ne faut pas qu'on se dise que c'est, c'est juste, pas juste. Ça vient pour contrecarrer l'éducation que les parents donnent, ça vient pour accompagner. Donc, ils peuvent rester sereins là-dessus. Les animateurs ont des contacts avec les parents. Eux, ils ont des retours sur ces questions-là. Donc, on n'a pas à s'inquiéter. Si l'enfant vient au centre, il ne va plus participer aux travaux de la maison. Non, ce n'est pas ça qu'on a eu des questions. Un enfant qui participe aux travaux de la maison, ça fait partie des sensibilisations qu'on leur donne. Les travaux, les jeux qu'ils doivent faire, il faut qu'on a, ils ont été formés là-dessus. Un enfant vient au centre, on lui dit sa responsabilité à la maison. Voilà. C'est ce que je voulais ajouter avant que Anna n'ajoute quelque chose. Many thanks, Anderson. To translate very quickly, um, this wasn't an issue um, that was noticed, according to Anderson, in the communities where this was put in place. And this is because the parents and the facilitators um, were interacting very frequently and often. And part of the responsibilities and the aims of the centres were to help children understand their roles as well as their responsibilities and their rights. So uh, understanding the difference between light work um, and hazardous child labour, for example, was part of that um, and obviously doesn't mean that children do no work at all but rather that the risks and the potential for harm are better understood by both parents and by adults. Anna would you like to add anything to that? I realise we're running a bit late on time. Yeah maybe just um, two sentences to also confirm that um, when we talked to parents and like explicitly um, gave them the opportunity to raise any concerns, this was indeed not at all an issue that came up. Um, on the contrary, um, parents really emphasized that um, the social skills that children learned at the centers uh, for them were of great value and um, that, uh, yeah, um they uh for them um having the possibility to um not um take their children um to the fields in the absence of other possibilities um was um a benefit much rather than um uh, yeah a loss of uh, of anything um it's it's really that came out very clearly um, from uh, group discussions and um, and, many, and the many conversations um, with parents, and that included yeah um, everyone. We tried to include everyone um, in the data collection, um, and yeah, as I said, really, um, it's not an issue um, that was raised by any group within the community. Thank you very much indeed. So we're a little over time, but I really appreciate all of you who stayed till the very end. Thank you very much. And um, huge thanks to our three presenters, Sabina, even though she had to leave us, Fidel and Anna. Um, and thank you also very much, Anderson, um, for the great points you were able to add on the road as you are. So have a really good day, everybody, and see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, bye.